How has the mainstream media performed as a reliable provider of news and analysis during the current crisis in the Middle East? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program. I'm Wain Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Adel Iskandar, Associate Professor of Global Communications at Simon Fraser University and co-editor of Jadalia. Adel Iskandar, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections, or rather to welcome you back since we spoke recently um, on the 20th commemoration of the death of uh, Edward Said. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks for having me back. Um, I'd, I'd like to focus this discussion primarily on the Western mainstream media, although um, towards the end we'll talk about um, uh, more global media. In order to set the stage, um, could you characterize, or is it possible to generalize, the Western mainstream media's approach to Israel and Palestine in the period before the 7 October attacks and the Israeli war on the Gaza Strip? Uh, absolutely. Thanks, Maureen, for asking that question. I think in a, in a very fundamental way, and I think for many of your listeners, what I'm going to say may be quite uh, intuitive and, uh, and fairly self-explanatory. But uh, for the most part, uh, Western media and, and you know, we, we, one could generalize, but I think it's it's fundamental to note that even within countries and locales and uh, and different uh, media markets, we tend to see quite quite a significant discrepancy in the pattern that I'm about to describe. But nevertheless, there is a a, a fundamental uh, and and wide reaching um, dynamic when it comes to discussions of Palestine Israel. Uh, for the most part, prior to uh, October 7th, Palestine was essentially off the grid completely. There was very, very little coverage of anything that is happening uh, either in the West Bank, uh, the occupied West Bank, uh, the Gaza Strip, or even Israel for that matter. If anything, Israeli coverage uh, was not uh, driven by um, uh, any existing contingency or constituency. Mainly about um, uh, the judicial legislative agenda of the Netanyahu yeah, government. Absolutely, from a political standpoint. But in fact, one were, if one were to widen the frame a little bit more, we see that uh, the vast majority of coverage about Israel is about the, uh, the tourism industry, the incredible modernization projects, uh, the technological advancements and innovations in various sectors. Uh, Israel's uh, remarkable advancement on all levels in all sectors and all kind of areas of knowledge production, uh, with the political being mostly kind of a, a domestic strife uh, that is uh, that is um, befalling Netanyahu and and his government. But that and, that's and there was there was that on the one hand, and then also some exposés about um, spyware, Pegasus, and so on um, uh, being sold globally and being used by all kinds of nasty regimes to spy on their own people and so on. But as yes. you said, very little about, let's call it Israeli-Palestinian relations. Absolutely. And I would actually add, uh, Maureen, to your point that even discussions that are critical of Israeli sort of spyware and its movement uh, mostly circulated within the alternative and independent media circles. Uh, mainstream media have, have fundamentally turned a blind eye to anything that is critical to Israel on the grounds that it might be um, considered problematic. Now, uh, keeping also in mind that uh, that wider discussions around occupation, apartheid, and the besieging of Gaza uh, were, had, had long since been eliminated from you know, public parlance around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Even the nomenclature, the lexicon mm -hmm. of those terms uh, were nowhere to be found in most Western press especially compared to 10 or 15 years ago, where discussions around occupation and around sort of, sort of the illegality of settlements in the West Bank, for example, was considered a uh, fairly standard practice. Even the siege on Gaza in its early days was a subject of conversation 15, 16 years ago in the media. But the lull and the gradual sort of disappearance of Palestinians from any mainstream coverage in the West is the environment prior to um, prior to October seventh? And I would also add that if any, you know, even if we were to do a very simple content analysis where we search for the term Palestinians in Western media coverage prior to October seventh, most of the references to the Palestinians actually related to 
uh, the um, the uh, the forthcoming Saudi order. normalization. Normalization, exactly. So mm -hmm. that, that the solution for the Palestinians was the normalization between Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries. With I was going to say, it seemed like Palestinians had been displaced by Saudis when it came to um, uh, the future of, of Palestine and Arab-Israeli relations. Absolutely. There was a, a patronage, an arrangement that reflected sort of a, a patronage or or guardianship on on. Uh, on behalf of Palestinians, uh, shepherded by the right. Saudis and and others in the direction of normalization. So Palestinians become a side note or a footnote in their discussion of their own actual fate. And it really so, is more about gas deals and oil yeah. deals and and sort of uh, collaborative uh, projects between various countries that they are the new Middle East. Yeah, in the new Middle East, exactly, exactly. Um, against this background. Uh... What are your main impressions of the media's initial response to the 7 October attacks um, by Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups uh, within Israel? I think in the the initial uh, the both the the attack and the immediate aftermath uh, were characterized by some of the very, very, very same patterns of coverage that we witnessed in the aftermath of 9 11. And uh, and even though, uh, you know, the attack. Could you elaborate on that point? Absolutely. So immediately after the, you know, 9-11, the attacks on the World Trade Center towers uh, and uh, and other strategic locations, including uh, the, the Pentagon and other, you know, for those who remember this period, this was a really sort of jarring moment of media coverage because some of the reporters uh, were on the ground uh, by sort of the World Trade Center towers and and elsewhere, and that really dominated the coverage. The the sort of the carnage and uh, and the the attack itself and the immediate aftermath became uh, a narrative that was almost impossible to displace. The collective grieving and mourning uh, became an impetus for retribution, retaliation, and uh, and revenge. So against uh, not only Al Qaeda but also Iraq. Uh, or anyone else that the that the state at the time articulated as uh, an arch nemesis or or an enemy or or a perceived threat. So we saw in the aftermath of 9/11 a discussion on on the part of George W. Bush and his uh, coterie of uh, of um, you know of, uh, of criminals essentially uh, the discussion about the, the axis of evil, and we're starting to see that same language emerge today, even. The term itself has been readopted, where there's a description of the new axis of evil. Some, of course, it's not new in the sense that some of the uh, perceived threats and enemies at the time are the enemies of today. But now Hamas and Hezbollah are collapsed within that as the nemeses of Israel and the perpetrators of this attack, or at least supporters of it. Now, but but my I, impression is not only the nemesis of Israel, but the nemesis of the entire West as well. Yeah. Yes, I think that is this is one of the unique sort of transformations of uh, of coverage when it comes to this particular attack, because immediately what Israel was extremely successful at doing at the outset is to articulate the attack of October 7, not as an attack against Israel as a state or its infrastructure or even its civilian communities, uh, but rather an attack against global Jewry. Right, the idea that that Jews were under attack, and that this was uh, a concerted effort to um, to essentially exterminate Jews from the world, and uh, the existential threat that Israel articulates in much of its policy making internationally, but also in its own uh, sort of narrative of of self affirmation, was clear as day, and it was that the use of those two in tandem in media discourses rendered the mainstream media in the West both um, um, sort of complicit in its affirmation, but also fearful of potentially uh, going against it, because to do so would, uh, would immediately uh, position it as quote-unquote anti-Semitic. If it becomes a, a problem, an attack on global Jews, then to critique any pre-existing structural problems that precipitate the inequities that may result in an attack <laughs> can, is is immediately incriminating. So so we begin to see kind of a um, uh, a chilling effect in the Western.
Because you see, it seemed, you know, on the one hand, you had reporters saying um, this is the worst um, attack that Israel has experienced on its territory since the state was established in 1948. And then also that this was the largest number of Jews killed in a single event since the Nazi Holocaust. Um, and you, at least from my perspective, you began to see the shift of trying to place these events in the context of the Nazi Holocaust in Europe in the 1940s, rather than of the Israeli dispossession and occupation and blockade of, of Gaza since 1948 or 67 or 2005 or what have you. Absolutely. These are these are really, really, really critical discursive uh, tools that are used by the Israeli state, but also picked up whole cloth by the mainstream media in the West so as to create juxtapositions and cognitive associations between the Holocaust and what was and what happened on October 7th. The so you're, you're saying you're mm -hmm. saying that the Western media basically uncritically adopted this is really talking point. Um, you know, yes. we're we're supposed to believe that we're dealing with the only free media in the world. Um, so how do you explain that um, uh, leading commentators, reporters, and so on were so willing to so uncritically parrot the Israeli interpretation of what had happened on the 7th of October? I think there are two, there are two sort of characteristics to why this unfolds. The first is, an actual structural problem within the Western media institutions, which is anchored on the idea of a two source approach, meaning that if there are two sides to the story, you need to be able to present both sides. But if one of the sides is seen as um, abhorrently criminal and terrorist, this is the articulation. Um, and irrespective of that camp is, it may not even be Hamas, it may just be Palestinians in general. Right? So, anyone who is in any way uh, critical of the now victims of this attack is seen as advocating for or supporting a quote-unquote terrorist political agenda and ideology. And so it creates a, a, a very complicated bind for these journalists who are looking for a second side to the story. So in fact, the other side of the story becomes Israelis who may have reservations about the way the war is conducted. So really, you have a, a complete domination of the media sphere by Israeli narratives. And of course, in this case, the, whether it's the IDF or Israeli officials, they get carte blanche. And they also have direct access to newsrooms, to uh, you know, a, you know, editorial letter writing. I mean, they, they have free reign to explain their narrative, to explain it. So that, I think, is, is one of the main structural problems, is that the news media found themselves having to choose between what it was articulated as a terrorist organization versus the, the state of Israel, which most Western governments through policy and other forms of knowledge production present as extensions of their own policies and extensions of their own projects. And I was gonna so say, um, the impression one, one received was it was not only the Western media coming out in full-throated support of a foreign state, um, but also that they were um, uh, dealing with their own government's um, unconditional and uncritical support for Israel. So this may have been an added factor in the way that they covered this story. Absolutely. I think one of the, one of the real key um, elements of this particular conflict is actually the lack of concert between media's production of, of information and content and reporting and the existence of publics, you know, whether publics exist or not, and whether or not they matter, and how people consume news, and whether or not they buy into news. That, I think, is, is the real sort of unspoken um, topic here. Um, of course, for the most part, when we talk so about- Just to clarify, are, are you suggesting that just as we've seen a growing disconnect um, uh, between state and citizen um, in, in many European and, and North American states in, in recent decades, that we're seeing a similar process at work between the mainstream media and news consumers? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Unquestionably. I think one of the key indicators of that is that the actual, quote unquote, battle for ideas is happening over 
the depiction and representation of this conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, in many instances, protesters, uh, you know, across the world, whenever they pass by major, you know, uh, media institutions, they usually have uh, fairly, you know, colorful language to describe and the paint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, and so, and in many instances, they the media organizations have become the epicenter of the battle over narratives and discourses and stories on the ground. It is for for you know, again, we're also talking about a generation. Uh, of of individuals, you know, most countries around the world have somewhere between, um, you know, thirty five and seventy five percent of their populace being under the age of thirty five, which means that most that generation is using social media and using information that is no longer uh, under the uh, the provision and um, and control of of the mainstream Western media. In other words, they, the mainstream media is not their primary uh, source of news and reporting. And not only that, but in fact, much of their much of the content that they access, even if it's coming from the Western media and mainstream media, it is also um, you know edited in such a way so as to reflect the pre-existing impressions, uh, emotions, and worldviews of those who are you know redistributing it or. Uh, or amplifying it. So, in a sense, even when they if, when they see Western media coverage of the conflict, sometimes it is imbued with a critique. So we can see how voices that are critical of the mainstream media coverage become amplified. And, and, and one of the main points um, of contention seemed to be the impression that Western mainstream news organizations often related in a sense that, you know, history began on the 7th of October versus many of these alternative um, sources of information that tried to place it in a broader context, whether it was a blockade or the occupation or the Nakba or what have you. Well, they, those types of things have, uh, they always have like a foot in the, in, in the sort of the political objective of uh, of excising and forgetting and erasing context. And then there's always another circumstance, which is a built-in structural problem. And one of the built-in structural problems of mainstream media in general is the fact that it is obsessed with the present. Mm -hmm. It is constantly focused on what is happening at this particular juncture, at this particular moment. So October 7th- the news cycle. Moment of the rapture, exactly. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fetishistic obsession with what is happening now. And in fact, I would argue that that obsession with the present is exactly why Israel is losing the information war, because October 7th is now very much further ancient away. Ancient history. Yeah. Ancient history, given what has transpired and Israel's sort of incredibly brutal attack. So now Israel has to constantly try to remind people that the initial you know, uh, the October 7th. The history began on uh, October, 7th. October 7th. Exactly. Whereas history keeps, continues to be rewritten by newspapers and journalists who are who consider their craft to be the first draft of history today. Mm -hmm. uh, long form journalism and long form reporting and feature reporting, which tends to delve into context and history and detail, is go falling to the wayside because most people are also looking for shorter uh, digestible um, packets of and packages of, of information through videos. If you can condense it, if you can condense a 75 year history or a 17 year history when it comes to Gaza within like a, you know, a minute and a half, then you can accomplish the goal. But in general, we are moving towards presentism and futurism, like designing news for tomorrow. So I, I'd now like to turn to the period since October 7th and Israel's onslaught um, on the Gaza Strip. What, in your view, has been the tenor of the mainstream media's approach to Israel's war on the Gaza Strip, taking into account that it is being increasingly characterized as an actual or potential genocide by international lawyers and human rights professionals? I think in the, uh, in the beginning, um, at least as far as Western mainstream media is concerned, we saw an incredible um, sort of cheerleading and support, kind of a like uh, almost like moving the Israeli jingoistic, hyper patriotic um, desire for for retribution and the discussion around self defense 
um, translated and taken in its entirety into the Western media coverage. Uh, but as, as um, the conduct of, of the war became, I mean, of course, there was also the incredibly incriminating rhetoric of genocide that was being generated by is the Israeli establishment, keeping in mind that Western mainstream media is looking for sources. So as it seeks sources within the Israeli media, it is finding all of this incriminating content and it is circulating. So the discussion of whether or not to report this or not becomes a discussion to be arbitrated by newsrooms. Like, do you relay the the official statement of you know the Ministry of Defense? Do you relay like Netanyahu's speech and such and such? How do you like what framework do you produce with this, right? Um, and for those of us who remember this time uh, when George W. Bush stood in front of the um, uh, gave a, a State of the Union speech and talked about not only the axis of evil, but also described America's war against uh, the Taliban and, and war on terror in, in a more generic sense and called it a crusade, but then had to work his language back. The Israelis are not having to work their language back. So with that comes a lot of really, really like complicated content that resembles and sounds like genocide. And the mainstream media have had to take a concerted effort to try and obfuscate or excise it. Instead, mm -hmm. it circulates mostly in these independent and alternative spaces of social media where publics are, are exposed to it, but in general, it doesn't break into that seal. So the decision uh, of what to include and what to exclude in the mainstream media was very rigidly predetermined with the understanding that anything that is critical of Israel may be misconstrued or at least used as ammunition against those news organizations on the grounds of being anti-Semitic. Again, this sort of mapping of, of Israel and, and, and global Jewry as one and the same. Now, where that changes, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Where that changes is with voices, not only from within the Jewish community, in, in the diaspora, but also within Israel, who have become critical of both the conduct of the war, the impetus of the war, and also laying down a, a fairly rational and, and historically accurate account of the conditions that precede October 7th. Mm -hmm. And what appears to be at first an, an impossible narrative begins to break through in those like fissures created by an incredibly muscular, almost fascistic discourse coming out of Israel and the incredible level of, of, um, of you know, victimization uh, and, and destruction of infrastructure. I mean, really everything that happened or has been done to Gaza by the Israelis uh, in the last you know, 40, 50 days, uh, it's, it's not only impossible to miss, but it, it goes against the grain of mainstream media's coverage to the extent that Western media can no longer ignore it. Well, but there's, I think, also another aspect, um, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. It's, it's my impression that when reporting Palestinian attacks on Israel or Israelis, and particularly Israeli civilians, these tend to be assessed through within a moral framework, a framework of, of morality, if you will. But when we're talking about Israeli attacks on Palestinians, and particularly Palestinian civilians, um, these same reporters often take a much more dispassionate, technical, analytical uh, framework uh, to report and assess these things. Now, I know that National Security Council um, uh, spokesperson John Kirby isn't a journalist. Um, he's, you know, basically a, a professional propagandist uh, for the White House, but nevertheless, I found him very indicative of, of this framework. You know, when first apprised that many Israelis had been killed on October 7th, he burst into tears um, in public. But then a few weeks later, when he was asked about the um, staggering number of Palestinian civilian deaths, he was all tough guy, he man, you know, well, civilians get killed in war. Um, that's the reality. Get over it. I mean, Maureen, you said it. You said it. Uh, there's, there's very little I can add to that, except to say that um, you know, there's very little empathy for Palestinian uh, loss of life, 
the the dispassionate ap approach to uh, the mass killing of I mean, I mean not, even before the killing, I mean the idea that one could besiege a 2.3 million person population uh, and withhold water, electricity, food, medicine, fuel. I mean, the idea itself is is presumably unfathomable. There is no circumstance anywhere in the world where Western governments would stand in support of that. Palestine becomes an exception. And so that it, that expendability of Palestinian life is is has become apparent, apparently a fundamental and intrinsic, essentialized part of the corpus of the political elite in in the West today. And whether or not this has something to do with, uh, you know, a fear of critiquing Israel on the grounds of be, being perceived as anti-Semitic, or because this is part of a larger, uh, you know, continuity uh, between, you know, settler colonial projects, or that it is actually a fundamentally racist and bigoted approach to human rights, where there's no such thing as moral equivalency. In any and all of those circumstances, the media forget politicians, because politicians have, you know, pragmatic agendas and their own platforms and allegiances. But from a media standpoint, this is extremely, you know, incriminating. This is the kind of stuff that one takes to court when, for example, you know, RTLM radio uh, in Rwanda, in Rwanda yeah. uh, advocated for, you know, would literally call uh, Tutsis cockroaches and justify the mass killings of hundreds of thousands of, of Tutsis. And motivate people to do precisely that, you know, the world was was shocked. And then we were still kind of reeling from that. And we're watching this happen not only on Israeli media, we're watching it on Western media organizations and in print everywhere from Sweden to the US and from Canada to Australia. You know, it's well, I think the Swedish prime minister yesterday said Israel had the right to commit genocide. Yeah. Hmm. But I'd like to take a specific example here, and, and that is a well-known story of um, Israel's invasion of uh, Al-Shifa Hospital uh, in Gaza City under transparently fraudulent pretenses, but with the full support of the U.S. and many European governments. Um, it seemed that the Western media, um, or at least the Western mainstream media, was repeating Israel's justifications um, up to and including, you know, the tanks bursting through the gates. And even now that it's become obvious that the only thing to be found there was a hospital, you're still getting reporting along the lines of Donald Rumsfeld's um, famous line, um, you know, the absence of evidence isn't the evidence, isn't the, uh, isn't evidence of absence. Yeah, the unknown unknowns. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think it's it's fair to say that um, Israel was, you know, Israel and and its military operation were remarkably successful at being able to convince the media that the only viewpoint worth pursuing was its uh, own. That, well, it was its own. Whether it's through embedded, you know, embedded reporting, having reporters literally be. On, and we know we and we know and we understand the incredible problematics of embedded reporting. Another incredible uh, legacy of Bush's war on terror and the way in which both the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq were reported was through embedded reporting. So Israel has followed suit precisely with that. But even in those circumstances, the the propaganda machine that Israel is is uh, is operating is not without its incredible faults. Um, it is it's to say the least <laughs> yeah, committing such incredible and remarkably juvenile blunders, you know, to the extent that even the journalists themselves are having to report back saying that the IDF is having to review all of their content, is not allowing them into spaces unless it's been approved, uh, is you know, is not, you know, really it's it's uh it's what we call uh, in propaganda models the flack, right? Where you know, after a certain point. Uh, the, there's no media autonomy. There's no journalistic integrity. Uh, it is literally being designed. By Just names the, of uh, Israeli military spokespersons uh, discovering a tunnel under every rock. Exactly, exactly. And of course, uh, also the interesting thing here is that you have folks like uh, Hud Barak coming out and saying that actually the tunnels under Shifa Hospital 
were actually built by Israel back when it controlled the tech. We so built it, but we can't find it. <laughs> find it, or when we find it, so then it's evidence that we need yeah. it. Yeah. I think the key here is is recognizing the incredible failure on the part of mainstream media to really identify the core of the story, which is the fact that you have a besieged population mm -hmm. that has uh, been sort of dehumanized for fifteen for seventeen years, and then. In the aftermath of that, you've got the mass incarceration of that population, its displacement, its robbing of its own humanity, and then a full-fledged attack with the purpose of ethnic cleansing and annihilation articulated clearly by the state and its operatives and, pre and reproduced by the media, and all of that story is missed. Now, what I would like to argue is that the story itself is not missed. The story is being actively silenced. There are, there are fundamental examples of how journalists and reporters are either being intimidated or having their stories be dropped or having assignment editors uh, move away from uh, or moving shifting their assignments to other stories. Uh, I mean, it is happening wholesale across well, the board in North America and Western Europe. Because that, that brings me to my next question, and I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that... Um, Western mainstream media were more critical of their own governments, for example, in the U.S. and U.K. during the Iraq war than they have been of Israel um, during its war against um, uh, the Gaza Strip. And you've given the point you just raised um, and also um, uh, fears of, of, of journalists or their editors of being tarred with the uh, brush of anti-Semitism by the Defamation League um, or, or other organizations that specialize in apologia for Israel. Um, give us some examples, if, if, if you have, of journalists being either um, taken off a story or perhaps even losing um, uh, their jobs or otherwise being muzzled. We heard early on about um, NBC uh, News, you know, this beacon of progressive liberal values. Um, basically removing a number of anchors uh, because they had the wrong religion. Yeah, of course, this is Ayman Mohideen, Ali Velshi, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and Hassan. <laughs> Mehdi Hassan. Yeah. Mehdi Hassan, sorry, mm -hmm. I remembered his last name, but not his first name. But the three of them, really, really stellar voice. And and the important thing about, um, about sidelining these reporters is not specifically just about the, their position vis-a-vis -vis Palestine and Israel, but rather, they are the three most seasoned individuals, more adept and more capable of describing the context of this conflict. Mm -hmm. So they would rather have individuals who know very little about the conflict take the lead in reporting the stories than to have their resident experts. So it's actually... Keep them dumb and away, happy. Exactly. Moving away from expertise, moving away from nuance, and decontextualizing as a set practice. But you have many examples. You've got examples of um, you know New York Times reporters resigning uh, you've got um, uh, actually there the the internal discussions are even more interesting where you have reporters who are pushing back against their own assignment editors and managing editors over the fact that they're pursuing stories but never actually seeing them in print so essentially forcing the these reporters to uh, to work but without yield imagine if you're working at a factory but there's no output or, you know, there's there's really nothing. I mean, and, and there are hundreds and hundreds of hours worth of reporting that never saw the light of day. Now, but I have to say, um, uh, Adit, I mean, fear of the defamation league um, doesn't quite add up. There, there, there seems to be more at work here than simply fear of, of uh, having mud thrown at you and false uh, accusations. I think I think one of the key aspects here it has less to do with the with the anti defamation league and has more to do with sorry the, defamation league defamation league mm. yeah <laughs> the um the 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 fun, again I I really genuinely believe that there's a structural problem here and the structural problem is that vast majority of mainstream media in the U S I should say perhaps more so than other places is um sorry. This, Um, the, 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 the structural problem here has more to do with, um, 
with the nature of private media. Private media are anchored and reliant and dependent heavily on advertising. And it is actually that relationship between media and corporate interests that makes media more and more um, um, concerned about losing their connections to their their source of revenue. But you, so, you, say, you say private media, yes. um, and this is, you know, Israel is a foreign state, but does it perhaps also make sense to look at these large mainstream news organizations as despite their status as private corporations, um, functioning on the basis of a state agenda? In other words, that they are taking their cues from the US or UK or German, whatever uh, government when it comes to their coverage of a foreign state and looking at their own government's relation and support or hostility to that particular state? At the risk of sounding uh, really unusual and controversial, I would say that the actual corporate interests may be greater than state interests. There are a mm -hmm. few instances to prove this, but I suspect that if there is a move whereby the, the state, you know, in, in some imaginary time in the future, uh, where the US government or other Western governments begin to take a, a stronger, more critical stance vis-a-vis -vis Israel, there's a good possibility that corporate uh, media, uh, co corporate mainstream media, may find themselves critical of the, of the government position because of their, you know, relationship to yeah. advertisers and the extent to which those advertisers exert significant effects. Now, keep in mind that in a, in a private media environment, the state actually does not matter. It, what matters most, the state is there to police uh, production, but in a country like the US where the first, first Amendment rules govern, it is actually corporate interests that are that prevail. It is the reason well, that brings why- me to my next question. Why would um, Apple or Coca-Cola or McDonald's um, care? I think they care because, uh, again, <laughs> if you follow the buck, I know it sounds really, really strange. This is sort of the political economy of communication approach to, to thinking through this. But um, but take the example of, of any statement made by any public figure uh, who has then been accused of, of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. What you, we see here is the incrimination of those companies, which can then result in the loss of of advertising revenue. and revenues, not only advertise, but like profit and revenue because they are consumer uh, consumer mer and merchandise products. Now, if there were to be a sizable change in public opinion, whereby uh, there, there wouldn't be negative repercussions to criticizing Israel. On that the would be a completely product, different ballgame. That would be a completely different ballgame. Now, what we're seeing today with the opinion polling may actually be that turning point where mm -hmm. consumer products and advertisers could potentially see the viability of a, of a critical stance vis-a-vis -vis Israel for their own, you know, lucrative, potentially lucrative, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, revenue generating ideas in the future. But up until this point, the basic mantra for advertising, for marketing, for, uh, for consumer uh, sales and production is to stay safe on Israel, to withhold any criticism, to perceive any criticism of Israel as inherently anti-Semitic, and you know there are few exceptions to that. Nevertheless, um, it does sound from what you've said that the Defamation League is consider going to have to considerably up its defamation game um, to keep things as they are. But before turning to that, I'd like to ask you um, about one or two other topics. Um, the first, of course, is that one reason um, we're getting so little news from the Gaza Strip is because um, news organizations have been banned from sending any reporters into um, uh, the Gaza Strip, that Israel has hermetically sealed the territory off for the foreign media. There are, of course, um, Palestinian journalists, and while a few of them work for very well-resourced um, organizations, um, uh, most of them are having to make do with very limited resources. And in fact, um, dozens of them have been killed uh, by the Israeli military. I think, um, I believe it was a committee to protect journalists that said this has been the deadliest conflict on record uh, for um, journalists. But 
we very rarely hear about either Israel's attempted blackout of the Gaza Strip um, or about the astronomical number of um, journalists killed by Israel in this war. I think this is uh, the the fundamental um, when when you see these things happening in tandem, the muzzling of journalists and in and, and media, both mainstream and alternative in the West, to ensure that Palestinian voices and experiences are not relayed or or uh, don't travel, and then simultaneously trying to silence reporters on the ground. We've seen that happen systematically on the mm -hmm. part of Israel in so many different locales in so many different conflicts. This is not new. Israel has targeted uh, journalists and reporters in every one of their uh, of the conflicts or attacks it's had against so many different groups, whether it's in the West Bank with settler attacks or in the Gaza Strip in previous wars, 2008, 2009, 2014, and then again now. Um, what, what makes this extremely tragic is the fact that um, Western news organizations that are operating in places where public opinion does matter, because Western countries are the ones bankrolling, supporting, and arming this, this genocide. Uh, in those circumstances, the voices of the people who are on the receiving end of these kind of tax, you know, tax covered arms um, are the ones without a voice. And they're without a voice because Israel has not only hermetically sealed the, the Gaza Strip, but made living inside Gaza so impossible that Western journalists and and in and you know foreign correspondents have not stationed their uh, their staff there because of liabilities and the incredible cost to risk mm -hmm. you know the potential of losing those staff which basically also affirms the idea that locally engaged staff or palestinian reporters are themselves once again expendable these are the people prepared to die to cover their own stories and, and often West, do and often do and and israel is more than happy to uh, to see that through you know, because to in in a sense, if if they cannot, uh, if the blackout doesn't silence the voices, if the presence of satellite uplinks uh, is able to kind of bypass that, if messages and videos are being able to circulate through the rock board or any other means, Israel finds that it is much more efficient to essentially eliminate those reporters completely. So they are being targeted; their families are being killed. Um, as you said, the committee to protect journalists said. Not only is it the deadliest conflict, it is the deadliest conflict since the committee started recording. Yeah. So this is this is mind blowing because one of, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, organizations that assess journalistic integrity, such as Freedom House, for example, U.S. based company, very often cites and lists Israel as the only free media in in the region, in the Middle East and North Africa. Now, hopefully, this can be revised, but historically. Every time Israel attacked and killed or maimed or injured a reporter, such as Shirin Abu Akleh, for example, not too long ago, a little over a year ago, um, in those instances, they would often happen in areas where Israel is treated as having non-jurisdiction, mm -hmm. which means that these are not attacks against journalists in its own territory, so they're hardly ever listed as, uh, as, a, as a, an incriminating act. But Israel is one of the I mean, there are jailers of journalists, and then there are killers of journalists. And Israel is one of the top killers of journalists, namely Palestinian, but also Lebanese. And yesterday, yes. the last couple of days, we I saw think four so far. I'm sorry. I think four, four so far. Four reporters across the border in in Lebanon, two of yeah. whom report for Al Mayadeen, Mayadeen yes, were, were killed yesterday. Yeah. And <laughs> and this is yeah, sorry. And this is uh, one of the one of the things that I want to say, Marine. I'm sorry yeah, to please. Like, well, one of the important things here is that the media and journalism in the West, who arguably are the comrades and the the uh, the the co-workers of many of those journalists, have themselves done very little to report on the attack of their own peers. Well, not only that, you had this hack uh, editor for um, this uh, German rag, I think it's called Built, celebrating the murder of the two uh, Mayadeen uh, reporters uh, yeah. yesterday. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking um, at the time because I, I know your time is limited. Um, perhaps uh, briefly, you know, one thing that this war has exposed is a growing chasm between the international community on the one hand 
and Western governments um, on the other. I was curious if you've seen a similar dynamic in terms of a fundamental difference of approach between Western and global media, and perhaps we should leave regional media out of the equation because one would expect them to take a much greater interest in covering um, uh, this war than, than um, more global media. I think the the manner in which the 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 war uh, has been covered and the attack on Gaza has been covered uh, really depends on the 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 nature of the media system in each of those respective countries. In many countries, the media itself is 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 state run, and and uh, and state run media have their own sort of uh, problems and predicaments in the sense that they reflect the policy of of that state, and because most states around the world um, have taken a fairly staunch position in opposition to Israel's uh, genocidal attack against uh, the pa Palestinians and Gaza in particular, um, most of those, most of that media reflects precisely that, focusing on the, you know, the, the death, the, the incredible uh, scale of death and destruction in Gaza. Um, in, in other instances where we've got, uh, you know, mixed media systems in, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in Southeast Asia, in uh, you know, in South Asia, uh, and in Latin America, we begin to see those positions reflecting the political ideologies of those newspapers, publications, and media. So, uh, but I would say that the vast majority have reflected a strong and staunch support of a global South position, meaning mm -hmm. that the, it is clear that the Israeli attacks are driven by the intent to commit ethnic cleansing. And that I think is clear and present in much of the coverage in most of those places. Overwhelmingly different from what we see from the global North and, and Western countries in the mainstream media, with few exceptions, of course. Yeah. But I think that is the polarity that we're yeah. beginning to see. And, and finally, Adel, um, how do you think um, the media coverage of Israel's war against the Gaza Strip um, over the course of October, November, and however much longer it's going to take, um, how is it likely to impact uh, news coverage, particularly of Israel and Palestine? I guess, do you think it will have any impact or does this form some kind of inflection point um, that will separate what came before from what comes after? I think in a very fundamental way, because media are meant to serve the public interest, even when they don't, there is the general expectation that basic standards are met by the newspapers, by the publications, by the media that believe in the integrity of news. Of course, I don't speak about Fox News, for example, who, of course, just really, you know, there's they've just been outed for faking a uh, Hamas ambush uh, recently. That's worth watching for those. How many died? <laughs> and the reporter presumably died, but it's still alive. No, it's it really it was really unbelievable. It's showing actors putting on and taking off clothes, acting like hostages. Um, anyway, but uh, but I think here the the important thing is to recognize that many of those news organizations will be hold held to account to describe those narratives, those discourses, those instances where history told a story vastly different from the stories that are being relayed at this moment. And and one where. Israelis um, die in the active voice and Palestinians invariably die in the passive voice, for example. Yes. But but also, I mean, of course, Hollywood will play a big part in this and in, uh -huh. in memorializing and, and, and consecrating the losses of, of Israel uh, at the expense of Palestinians. But but I would say that I, I reserve some uh, some hope in that um, the if there was another reason to discredit mainstream news media coverage, not only of uh, of Palestine Israel, but also its coverage of uh, you know BIPOC communities, indigenous communities, uh, and anybody really on the right side of history, this would be kind of the nail in their coffin. Um, and I would argue that the vast majority of mainstream media are no longer even the agenda setters of public opinion. So so I think to an extent, mainstream media need to reinvent themselves and really look inside them and figure out. You know where they're, you know where they stand vis-a-vis -vis this type of dynamic, with the understanding that publics are watching and publics are calling them into, uh, you know, they they may not be taking them to court or they may be able to save their own skins from uh, from uh, litigation, 
but nevertheless, uh, because they are mainstream and private, they need readers. And mm -hmm. if you lose readers, then you lose the institution. So I think there's a lot to feel hopeful about. Uh, the public awakening really matters, and publics are the driving force behind how media is covered. Adil Iskandar, thank you very much for once again sharing your insights and expertise with Connections. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Maureen.